cultural revolution in China, Maoism, the, the, the Red Guard, that I always found the most terrifying. The, the, the enlisting of the children of the younger generation and the humiliation of the elders and the professors and so on. There is something really blood chilling about that that I feel is in its very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nursery crop at the moment. It's in its very nascent stages, but that's the flavor or the strand in what's happening to some extent that I don't like at the moment. Well, can yeah. I, can, I, can, I, can I quibble with a bit of that? Yeah, mm, I think course, Chris yeah. Greenwald said that and if I can, quibbled with him too. If I can swallow a bit of food. You talk, you said enlisting. Mm. I think what's different now is there is no enlisting. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right, no, yeah. There are no shadowy older figures pulling pulling the strings. Oh, they're no. they're terrified. You know mm. what what there is. There is a sort of um, and I suppose if you took a big kind of you know long term historical view, you might look at it as kind of a, a youth worship, mm. right? You know, mm -hmm. youth worship that, that goes back to the invention of the teenager. That we are now convinced that once you pass the age of thirty, whether you admit it or not, you are convinced <laughs> that people who are younger than you know more than you now. Yeah. You may be right about that. They may know more than you. They are better educated. You know, younger people are better educated than we were, better read than we are. We were have access to far more information than we did, for the most part. So they may know more than we do. But I think it's also, it's the same thing as sort of you know, people who were fifty being a bit intimidated by the Rolling Stones. It is youth worship. <laughs> it's the speeding up of generations in that respect, though, isn't it? They you used to say a generation was literally a generation, like twenty five years mm -hmm. or whatever. Now. Well, for a start, people have children later now, so I guess generations get stretched. But also, a generation now seems to be defined by: Are you the iPod generation, the iPhone generation? Are you the, <laughs> you know, the, are you the five G generation? Any new iteration of technology which significantly changes the way we communicate mm. with one another sort of mm. can, at a stroke, make you feel like you're yesterday's man. It's also not even just kids. I mean, I find that charitable organizations or organizations like the ACLU, they, I mean, they kind of stoke up these issues too, because, you know, take something like Stonewall. I mean, Stonewall has done amazing work for LGB rights over the years. And it, to a certain extent, you know, the gay rights, well, obviously still ongoing, you know, homophobia is still a thing, but they've achieved a lot of what they set out to achieve. So they then need to find a new thing. And their focus right now is on gender issues, on trans issues. And, mm. if, you know, they are now going around lecturing offices and schools about that. Now, you know, they have had to find a new thing to do. And that's yeah. another thing that become part of the culture towards the ACLU has become a big part of that. The AC, you know, American Civil Liberties, you know, that's, that's still a fight. But when you look at their social media feed, it's entirely about gender issues right now. They've, need to, they've had to find a way to stay relevant. And so they find an issue that is quite a hot button thing and they stoke it up to a certain You know that the Eric Hoffer quote, which I bring up roughly once per podcast of any kind, <laughs> he says, uh, every, every great cause starts as a movement, becomes a business and ends as a racket. <laughs> and, and it's not a reflection on on the on the uh, justification for the original cause at all. In fact, if right, anything, right. the more justified the right. cause, the the greater the the core of heat which will drive it. Well, I I I, I do think still. I agree with everything that's been said. I do think still social media is so. It, none of this would be happening in mm. the same way with the same yeah. intensity yeah. without social media because all the things that uh, Hadi was just talking about, especially what she was talking about just before. Uh, about in you know, the coddling of the young and the uh, sense that all your opinions, every one of them is worthwhile and needs to be listened to and understood. That's just a version of what's happening. <laughs> yeah, Twitter, yeah. Because Twitter has bifurcated, not bifurcated, multifurcated opinion so that every single person now does have a voice. I mean, literally does, that can have power. And that is theoretically a good idea because theoretically, not theoretically, historically, the world used to be just a few people having a voice and a few people having power. And that's how the world was for years. And obviously, democracy itself was just a sort of cat-candid version of giving everyone else a voice because it was only really a voice once every four years or whatever. Now, everyone has a voice all the time. We are in Babel. And it's really, it's had some good effects. And it's had some really, really bad effects. And I think that thing that, that Hadley was talking about, which is, the mad kind of over focus on every single opinion being given like time and space and listened to and things that are not social media ish like well that person's actually quite old and that means they may have lived a good life and have a lot of experience outside of the computer just in like that's completely naught because yeah. you know they're not saying stuff on twitter they get seven thousand likes or whatever 
So I, and it I just does, think... social media unquestionably rewards extreme views as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not everyone being outrageous. themselves, it's them learning very quickly how the attention economy works and what they need to do. 